So in this episode, we'll see how to build LLMs from the decoder part of the transformer. These are known as GPTs, Generative Pre-trained Transformers. And they became famous after the launch of ChatGPT by OpenAI. Today, GPT models power all major LLMs beyond ChatGPT, like Google's Gemini, Anthropic's Claude, Meta's Llama, Mistral, you name it. So without any further ado, Let's get started. In the last episode, we saw how the decoder component of the transformer excels a text generation, one token at a time. It uses self-attention to allow the model to consider the context of the entire sentence when predicting the next word. In 2018, OpenAI published a paper titled Improving Language Understanding by Generative Pre-Training. In this paper, they showed how the decoder could be used to create a powerful language model they called GPT for generative pre-trained transformer. Similarly to what Google did with BERT, the idea is to have a pre-training phase where the model learns representations of language from large amounts of unlabeled data. The resulting base or foundation model can then be fine-tuned for specific downstream tasks without requiring large task-specific datasets. The pre-training task chosen for GPT is next word prediction. This is a basic language modeling task, and indeed, we already covered it when we saw how to build a language model using a recurrent neural network. In next word prediction, given a sequence of input words or tokens, the model learns to predict the likely subsequent word. We append this new word to the original sequence and then feed this back into the model to generate the next token. This iterative process allows us to keep generating text in what's called an autoregressive fashion. Next word prediction is a perfect pre-training task because we don't need to collect labels for the training data explicitly. Instead, we can leverage the structure of the data itself to create the labels that the model is supposed to predict during training. Creating labels on the fly allows us to leverage massive unlabeled text datasets during the pre-training phase. For reference, the original GPT-1 model had 12 layers, 117 million parameters, and was pre-trained on a large dataset of books from the internet called Book Corpus. In 2019, OpenAI released GPT-2 with 1.5 billion parameters, and it had 10 times the size of GPT-1, and was trained on 10 times as much data. After that, came GPT-3, released in 2020, that was the foundation for the release of ChatGPT. GPT-3 had about 175 billion parameters and was pre-trained on a corpus of 500 billion words, mostly coming from a dataset called Common Crawl that was gathered from a large internet archive together with Wikipedia articles and books obtained from the internet. At the time, this was the largest dataset used to train a model. Now, with a pre-trained model like GPT, we could fine-tune it for a specific task, such as text classification, by adding a layer on top, exactly as we did for BERT. Yet, GPT models are often used very differently, and that's exactly where their power lies. After pre-training larger models like GPT-2 and GPT-3, OpenAI made a surprising discovery. These models exhibited so-called emergent abilities. That is, the models could perform tasks they were not explicitly trained for, such as translation, question answering, or summarization. This could be achieved simply by providing a natural language prompt describing the task. As the model predicted the next token to complete the prompt, it would often generate a valid response for that task. 
The ability to perform a new task without direct training is called in-context learning, and it can take different forms. Zero-shot refers to the model being able to understand and generate an answer for a task directly, without having to see any examples in the prompt. One-shot learning involves showing the model a single task example before attempting it. For example, seeing one sentiment analysis example before being asked to give the sentiment of a review. Few shot learning is an extension where the model is shown a few examples of a task in the prompt before being asked to carry it out. If you're like me, you must be wondering how is all of this even possible? I mean, the model has been trained on completing sentences with the most probable words. So logically, if we provide it the start of a document, say a Wikipedia article, it's likely to complete that article with statistically meaningful words. That makes sense. It's what we trained the model for. But how can it now, all of a sudden, start performing arbitrary tasks, such as summarizing a document, translating a sentence, and so on? If you think about it, this does make sense. Models like GPT-3 have been trained on a vast portion of the internet, encountering diverse topics, styles, languages, and tasks. As a result, the model indirectly learns about many tasks that are common in the data it was trained on. For example, the training dataset includes content from Reddit, Stack Overflow, Quora, and so on. So the model has encountered numerous instances of question answering, summarization, and translation, allowing it to learn these tasks implicitly. We saw that GPT models trained on vast amounts of data have an emergent ability that allows them to sometimes perform tasks given to them as prompts in natural language. However, the models were still far away from being reliable at performing tasks. Nonetheless, they did show potential. Now, exploring and building on this potential, OpenAI introduced the concept of instruction fine-tuning with models like Instruct GPT. This approach involves fine-tuning a GPT model not on specific downstream tasks, but to follow instructions in natural language. This can be done by creating a dataset of prompts, instructions, and completions, desired responses, to teach the model how to understand and execute a wide range of instructions more accurately. The Instruct GPT dataset contained over 13,000 prompts across different tasks like summarization, question answering, translation, and analysis. For each task, the dataset had examples of human-written responses aimed at providing helpful and truthful outputs. To improve the model's ability to distinguish between instructions and expected responses, special delimiters are often used during the fine-tuning phase. These markers surround the instructions in training data, clearly separating them from the completions that follow. This method helps the model to better learn the distinction between what is being asked and what the appropriate way to respond is. To achieve better results in chat scenarios, models are often fine-tuned on datasets specifically annotated with formatters for dialogue. For example, Google's Gemma uses specific tokens to help the model learn roles in a conversation, such as the difference between user and assistant model, and it uses the limiters for multi-turn conversations. InstructGPT introduced a more straightforward approach to fine-tuning and interacting with language models. Instead of requiring experts to design and add layers or make adjustments to the model for each new task, InstructGPT and the following assistants that came can understand and respond to a wide range of instructions right out of the box. This change simplifies the interface to the model, enabling people to engage with them using plain language to get tasks done. 
And this is what made GPT models so successful. While instruction fine tuning improves the ability of GPT models to follow instructions in natural language, there is still an issue. These models can generate harmful, biased or untruthful outputs. To mitigate this, model creators often use an additional training technique called reinforcement learning from human feedback or RLHF. The basic idea behind RLHF is simple. Have humans evaluate outputs from the model and provide feedback on which ones are better or preferred. We can then use that feedback signal to fine tune the model towards generating more desirable outputs. This process would involve having the model generate answers for a given prompt, asking human raters to evaluate the answers with a score, say one or zero, based on factors like truthfulness, safety, and helpfulness. Using that human preference as a reward to fine tune the model towards generating the preferred output. This fine tuning involves the use of algorithms that can update the weights of the model to follow a policy that maximizes the human reward. A common algorithm is PPO, Proximal Policy Optimization. However, evaluating hundreds of thousands of outputs from the model with human raters is extremely expensive and very inefficient. So researchers developed a way to scale up RLHF using a reward model. The reward model is a separate classifier model, such as BERT, that is first trained on actual human preference data to learn to predict which outputs humans would prefer. To train this reward model, we built a data set by having the LLM produce two answers for every given prompt. We get humans to rate the answers, and then we use this data set to fine tune the reward model. Once this reward model becomes accurate enough at imitating human feedback, we can use it in place of human raters during the RLHF process. Reinforcement learning from human feedback has proven somewhat effective in training state-of-the-art LLMs like ChatGPT. However, this is still a weak form of reinforcement learning, as it's based on imitation of humans. This makes it expensive and it doesn't scale well because it requires a large amount of human laborers to be involved in the process. So it's likely that future advances will need stronger forms of reinforcement learning or entirely new approaches to create models with a deeper understanding and more versatile intelligence. I want to close this episode by showing a map of the most relevant LLMs that we have today. In the proprietary space, we have, of course, the GPT series of models by OpenAI, we spoke about the initial GPT-1 to 3, but we then have GPT-3.5 and GPT-4 and their turbo versions, which currently power chat GPT. For reference, GPT-4 is rumored to have 1.7 trillion parameters. Google, of course, has its own models. Palm is the old series of models, which was replaced by Gemini that comes in three different sizes. Nano, Pro, and Ultra. We also have the new Gemini Pro 1.5, which was recently released and has an incredible context size of up to 1 million tokens, the largest available by far. The other big player in the proprietary space is Anthropic, with their Claude models. They recently released Claude 3, which plays in the same league as Gemini and GPT-4 and comes in three sizes, Haiku, Sonnet and Opus. Other proprietary models worth mentioning include the Amazon Titan series, available on AWS Bedrock, which comes again in different sizes, and Cohere's Command series of models, with Command R and Command R Plus recently released and optimized for accuracy on retrieval augmented generation tasks. The open source space is also very crowded. 
There's the debate on the term open source though, as most models just come as a set of weights without any training data. So it'd be more correct to say that these models are open weights. Leading the way, we have Meta's Llama family, a collection of foundation models ranging from 7 billion to 65 billion parameters and pre-trained on more than 1.4 trillion tokens. Although initially only available for research purposes, the weights of Llama were leaked within a week from its launch, which in turn sparked a lot of derivatives. For example, only two weeks after the leak, Stanford released Alpaca 7B, which is a fine tune of Llama on a 52,000 instruction following dataset. Vicuna was another fine tune of Llama on conversations, and it was a joint effort from multiple research groups. Wizard LM is another instruction fine tune of Llama using the Evol Instruct dataset, which is freely available for download. In July 2023, Meta released Llama 2, with variants from 7 to 70 billion parameters, and both base and instruction fine tuned models. Llama 2 doubled the context size to 4,000 tokens and was pre-trained on a dataset of over 2 trillion tokens. Soon after, Meta also released the code Llama variants, specifically fine-tuned for code generation. Mosaic ML released another family of models called MPT, again in different sizes and with different fine-tunes for instruction following and chat. Microsoft, while funding the OpenAI's proprietary LLMs, has also been somewhat active in the open source space, releasing models like Orca and Phi. The Phi family is particularly interesting because it focuses on creating small models. Phi 2 is only 2.7 billion parameters, but shows very good performance in a lot of benchmarks. Another important open weight player to mention is the French startup Mistral, which released very powerful models, including their recent Mixtral model. This is one of the first open source models to use a mixture of expert architecture, which enhances the standard performance of a decoder. Mixture of expertise also believed to be used in all major proprietary models we discussed before. Finally, although focused on catching up with OpenAI, Google has also recently released a series of small open source models called Gemma, available both as base models and instruction fine tunes. This was another quite long and intense episode, but extremely, extremely fun to make, and I hope you enjoyed it. As usual, if you want to support the channel and see more of these videos, please like, comment, and subscribe so the YouTube algorithm keeps pushing the videos to more and more people that are interested in this kind of stuff. See you next time.